Monday. Thanks for coming, everybody. I'm standing in for Mike. My name's James. I am sick, unfortunately, so we all hope it gets better. Thank you. Thank you to the tap group for hosting Science Club, as always. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, sir. I hope it's also free. I think it's very nice and it works out great for everybody. Uh, thank you to Alaska Commons for recording the presentations and publishing them on the internet. If anybody wants to go and look at the public or look at the uh, presentations, search for Alaska Commons, nice and we should be able to find them there. <laughs> And once again, thank you to all the Alaska Science Club volunteers. Uh, they worked to put this on so that we can have a Science Club. Also, thank you for donations. They keep Science Club going. They allow us to be able to do presentations, find presenters, uh, award prizes, and those types of things. Uh, we also want to announce tonight we have a clearance sale for our Science Club uh, pie glasses. And see Karen over there if you're interested. $10 for a stocking stuffer. Or you can stock put something in it. Possibly something that's all in While we are getting the rest of the uh, answer keys, I'll introduce the speaker. Lisha Nolan began appending initials to the end of her name at Cornell University, then continued the trend with a mix of P, H, M, and Ds at the University of Pennsylvania. She went on to Boston Children's Hospital where she spent time playing with, emulating, and treating children. She spent three years in Edinburgh, Scotland, where she ate haggis and evaluated genetics. In 2013, she began her current career at the CDC, Center for Disease Control and Prevention. She joined the Epidemic Intelligence Service, a team of elite disease detectives that study disease trends. Since joining the CDC, she has spent time all over the world, in Sierra Leone, Liberia, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Indonesia, and Vietnam. She has recently joined us in Alaska as part of the CDC's, we have all the uh, answer sheets collected, Arctic Investigations Program, where she works to stomp out disease all around us. So please welcome Alicia Nolan. Um, at the end of that, I, I finished my MD-PhD, 
It turns out if you only have a medical degree without going to residency, it's not that valuable. So I decided I should go on and do a residency, and I went and did pediatrics. So I went to Boston and did a residency in pediatrics there. If, if you, lots of people ask me why did I do pediatrics, and so my theory is if you're a doctor, you're going to deal with a lot of poop. And it turns out baby poop smells much better than adult poop. So that was how I made my choice. I decided I was going to go with the better option, and I went for pediatrics. So I went and uh, worked at Bo in Boston as a pediatric resident. Um, while I was there, this is very awkward, I'm sorry that I had to lean over and think about it. Um, while I was there, I had an opportunity to go work as a volunteer doctor in Africa. I did on two different occasions for two different months. One was in Lesotho, which is that tiny little country that's completely surrounded by South Africa. And then another month in Kenya. And actually, I'd say, in a way, this is what started me thinking about how interesting it was to work in underserved areas and internationally where you don't have an MRI right at your hand any time you want. So this sort of started putting these ideas in my hand, head of working other places. After that, I, of course, decided, hey, why finish training when you can do more training? Um, so I went and did a postdoc in Edinburgh, Scotland. Um, I was looking at genetics of eye diseases and epigenetics of how the body develops. Make it simple. Um, and then it, it, what I was doing was really a lot of laboratory work, and I was planning on going and trying to do a faculty position at some university. Except for there was this problem. About three years in, I realized I really didn't like being in the laboratory. I don't know how many of you have worked in labs. Have a lot of you worked in labs. So we, anybody who works in the lab can, if they're being honest, admit it's exceptionally repetitive. You're taking liquid from one tube into another, one tube into another, one tube into another. And it, I realized I didn't only not just not like that, but I also was pretty bad at it. I did one tube into another, one tube into another. Oh, which one did I do? And that's not a good way to be a scientist. Um, and the more I thought about this, I realized I had, in a positive world, at least eight more years of that before I got to the point where I wanted to be, where I could be that professor, where I could really plan the experiments and have those lowly postdocs do it for me. And I just didn't really want to do eight more years of that. So I started looking at what else could I do. And as any good scientist does, I decided the best way to choose my future career was to crowdsource on Facebook. <laughs> so I put up a post on Facebook and I said, any ideas what someone who has an MD, PhD can do as a career? And really, there were not many suggestions. <laughs> but one did come up that was this person who said, hey, I have this friend who did this really cool thing at, e at CDC where they got to go and like work in Africa on eye diseases, and it sounded amazing. You should apply for that. And I'm like, I have no idea. Why not? CDC, I can do that. I'll apply. And, and so that's how I got into where I am now. So, okay, I find that when I tell people I work for CQC, they come up with a few images in their head. So one would be this. Contagion, Gwyneth Paltrow, horrible disease, takes over the world, lots of people die. And CDC, of course, is this conqueror. Or they come up with this, more recently, The Walking Dead, where, again, CDC battles The Walking Dead, they go and take over the campus of CDC. And, I mean, really, that's almost true, but not completely true. Um, and CDC really is a branch of the federal government. We are headquartered in Atlanta, Georgia. And what CDC is tasked to do is to work to improve the health and protect the health of all Americans. So what exactly does that mean? Well, public from health threats. Well, it could be at home or abroad, right? Is it influenza in our own country that's being spread between people and hurting people? Or is it Ebola? that, you know, wasn't killing Americans, but did pose a health threat eventually to Americans if we didn't solve it. Or we also talk about diseases that are chronic and acute, and I find everybody, when they hear about CDC, they think we deal with Ebola and influenza and uh, other dramatic infectious diseases, and they forget that we actually deal with all sorts of chronic diseases. We deal with heart attacks, lung cancer, uh, motor vehicle accidents. So CDC is interested in all things that affect public health. And then also 
so we are interested in things that we can cure. Of course, that's the <laughs> exciting stuff. But we also are interested in things that we can prevent. We're not going to cure our motor vehicle accident, but we can help prevent them. So that's one thing that people do in XCDC. Uh -huh. And then, of course, there's also not just natural things that cause disease, but deliberate attacks or human error. So we cover all this. CDC as a group, as an institution, covers all these different areas. So public health really aims to do a number of things. We look at problems that affect many people. So a doctor, when I was a pediatrician, I would treat this child in front of me. As a public health worker, I am treating the population. So you have a much broader scope. But you don't just do that. You, of course, evaluate what is being, what you can do to affect that population. And then you try to get things to change. So you advise policy, try to get different laws to pass. You go and try to advise healthcare workers so that they can do better treating their own patients and do good for the entire population. And then also we have the more dramatic part is where we respond to emergencies. We identify emergencies and we go out and try to take care of them when they occur. So I joined this program. It's called the Epidemiology, ah, sorry, Epidemic Intelligence Service. And if you think CDC is not trying to encourage this dramatic view itself, then you have to wonder why did they choose the name Boots on the Ground Disease Detective? <laughs> that is obviously makes us sound really cool, right? So I, and this woman right here, Cindy, she is a current disease detective in front of us. Um, she, so we get to be this elite team of disease fighters. So as an EIS officer, which is what I was, um, we focused on epidemiology. And so you all think, what the heck is epidemiology? It's really a study of health events in the population, looking at who it occurs to and how frequently they occur. So really, if you think about it, there's a few questions. What are make, what's making people sick? Who is it who's getting sick? And why are they getting sick? So you could say, what's making people sick? Well, maybe it's because they eat too much. Or maybe it's because it's actually Zika. Or maybe they're getting sick because they smoke and get lung cancer. So there's all different reasons people get sick. And we try to look at those and try to figure out who is getting sick. People who are in daycare, little kids, get a lot of viruses, right? So we try to look at, is it a specific population that's getting sick, and we should target that population. And then we want to know, why are they getting sick? Is it some animal exposure they had? Or is it a new virus that's going around? Or maybe it's because they aren't exercising at all. So epidemiology, we're trying to look at all these questions, figuring out who, why, and what people are getting sick with, and then find a way to solve it. So I started at CDC in July of 2013, um, and it turns out CDC is in mix. And as you can see here, I've listed all the branches I know about, and then I'm sure there's many more, but they all have sort of different focuses. You can see on there, there's TB, there's malaria, there's foodborne disease, there's all sorts of different things. And what was interesting is when you're accepted into this boots on the ground disease detective, you're accepted into the general thing, and then you get to choose which one you want to work in. And I'm pretty sure when they hired, or when they chose me, they hired me, they were saying she is going to go to birth defects and developmental disabilities. Or, uh, yeah, disabilities. I mean, obviously, I'm a pediatrician, and I am doing genetics as my research. That is the perfect fit. But why go with something easy when you can do something you have no idea about? <laughs> So I went and did emerging and zoonotic infectious diseases because it sounded cool. <laughs> and it turns out I was right. So now I, of course, everybody, you know, anybody, when we meet a new person, we say, oh, what do you do? And I say, I work for CDC. And then there's that next pause, and they say, so what does that mean? And it turns out that is an exceptionally hard question to answer. And when I try to answer it, I often get this blank stare. <laughs> and I realized, no, nope, they're not getting it. And if, if it's somebody who's a little bit more polite, they might be interested in blank stare. But it's still a blank stare. And what I usually want is I want an opportunity to sit there with that person and show them pictures of what I do. So you all get that tonight. So, okay, the first disclaimer was from the U.S. government. So now this disclaimer is from me. And essentially what it says is, I'm showing you the coolest stuff I've done in my career. And in many ways, this is like 
Facebook. I could show you pictures of Excel. I could show you pictures of my desk in a cubicle. But no, of course, I'm going to show you the cool stuff. So just remember, this is the best parts, not regular life. OK, so I've been at CDC for four years now. Um, for two years, I was this boots on the ground, ground EIS disease, de uh, disease detective. And I was in the bacterial special pathogen branch. Then last year, I did a year in Vietnam, and I was running a training program where you could say I was really training Vietnamese doctors and public health workers to make a Vietnamese CDC. And then six months ago, I came here. So the one thing when people ask me, what do I do with CDC, is that I can tell, say very assuredly, is I have traveled. So I've gone to every red dot on here. And I, I could tell you a story about every red dot, but of course, that would take a while. So tonight, I've decided to tell you four stories from four of my red stars. So the four stories, one is an outbreak, one's an epidemic, one's an insight, and one's an investigation. So start out dramatic, right? We're going to start with an outbreak. So DRC, um, the Democratic Republic of Congo, country smack dab in the middle of Africa, essentially. So CDC will often get requests from other countries for assistance when there's a health issue. And CDC will never go into a country unless we get that request. But if we get that request and it's something valid, we'll go and help that country. And so I was at CDC, and I was with a group that responded to a request from DRC. And the people who called us said they had seen a sudden increase in monkeypox cases. They, they usually see maybe 20 or 5 to 50 of these cases a year, and suddenly in the last month, they saw 85. This is not normal. Something is wrong, and they needed our help. So, what is monkeypox? I know all of you are thinking that right now, right? So, imagine, we all know what chickenpox is. Probably the most of us in here had chickenpox. Itchy, annoying, most people don't die, right? On the other end, smallpox. We all in here know what smallpox is. Luckily, none of us had it, I think. Um, lots of bumpies, horrible. Lots of people die, really disfiguring. Monkeypox, kind of in the middle. Same kind of disease, you get these pox all over your body. And in monkeypox, probably about 5% of people die. So, not good, but it's not smallpox, right? So suddenly, DRC is having more of these cases. So I want to ask the crowd, how does one get monkeypox? Where does it come from? Thank you. And that would be wrong. Okay, okay. Just like how we do not get chickenpox from chickens, we do not get monkeypox from monkeys. But actually, we don't really know where we get monkeys, monkeypox from. Um, but we do know it's probably an animal host. Probably not monkeys, however. It is something in Africa, and that's why it's been called monkeypox, is because it's in the region where animal exposures were, and at first people thought it was monkeys. Right now, we don't think so. So the question we had is, why was this suddenly spreading so badly in DRC? Why did they suddenly have so many cases? Is it something the people are doing? Maybe maybe the people are getting it, they're eating something unusual, or maybe they're going someplace where they're getting exposed, or maybe something like an animal's coming into their house and giving them the virus. Why is it? And we wanted to also know, are there specific people at risk? The, the country could tell us there have been a lot of cases, but it was it little kids, was it the elderly, were it people with other health problems? So this is what we aim to do. We went to Africa to figure out why people were getting sick with it and who was getting sick with it. So we first flew into um, Kinshasa, which is the capital of Congo, um, and there was a group of about six of us from CDC Atlanta who went. And then we flew out into a small village in a plane where we landed on a soccer field, um, and started looking at cases. And it turned out that the area we went to is where the majority of cases had been, but now there was a new cluster out more rural. And so they decided that most of the people were going to stay and do this uh, investigation where there had been a lot of cases, but they wanted a few people to go out to this really rural area and look at these new cases. And I got to be the lead. So. Me and my elite disease fighting team um, got into a truck and went into really, really rural Congo. And so all these are actually local Congolese who are either public health workers or doctors who went along with me. 
And so we got to have a very exciting car ride um, into really, really out there Africa. And then we, we wanted to find out what was going on. So we would go into villages and we'd ask, has anybody had these symptoms of monkeypox? And then the local people who were with me, who of course spoke the language, would sit and we'd have these conversations with the families about what did they eat? What had they done? Had they traveled anywhere? Were they exposed to anybody who had similar symptoms? What kind of animals were they catching? Had they been hunting? All these questions trying to figure out what made these people get the disease. And we, we could talk to huge groups of people about this. And of course, everybody was very interested to talk to us because we're foreigners. Well, I was a foreigner, and that was very unusual in that area. So it drew a lot of attention. And then not only did we ask questions, but we also took people's blood. Because by taking blood, we could see who was exposed to monkeypox. Because not everybody gets symptoms. Some people are exposed and never get sick. So we could take that. And in the end, we ended up talking to over 75 people about what they were exposed to and where did they get their food and all this, who had gotten monkeypox. And then we actually ended up taking blood from over 210 people um, to be able to see who had been exposed. And actually, we found a pretty good linkage. The linkage was to squirrels. So we had multiple families tell us about how families had captured squirrels, used played with them as pets, then mysteriously the squirrel died, and two days later the people in the family got sick. Um, and then a few people also who didn't have quite as clear a story, but they did eat squirrels. So this was our best estimate. And because of that, we had things we could go out and talk to people about. So not only did we go do an investigation, but we went out and did education. And so we took a portable battery-powered uh, uh, projector, and we went to whatever physical structures there were. This is a church, which is generally what you would find as a physical structure in Africa. Um, and projected things, and we didn't just focus on this. We tried to do projections about all different health issues, of, about how to protect yourself. So that was an outbreak, and one outbreak that I've been involved in. So okay, so story one is done. So story two, an epidemic. So I actually want to go back to this picture. So this is a movie, Contagion, right? And so when I was an EIS officer, I would often cite this movie and say, you know what is Paltrow and Contagion? So I have her job, except for I don't die and I'm sexier. <laughs> and I believe that's pretty true, but there was a slight problem is that I'd actually never seen this movie. So I was citing a movie about what my career is based on what other people told me, but they were people at CBC, so I tended to believe them. But then I did intend to watch the movie, and I just had never had a chance. So finally, I had a chance. I was on a plane. I was looking through the movie list, and sure enough, Contagion was on the list. I'm like, great, I can finally see this movie. I always talk about it. I should probably watch it. So I start watching it, and I'm about five minutes in, and people are starting to drop dead. And then there's a few people who are just getting symptoms, and I'm like, maybe this is not the right movie as I, that I should watch as I fly to the Ebola response. So I stopped watching that. <laughs> so yeah, I went to the Ebola response um, it, in West Africa. I actually went first in April and May of 2014 in Liberia. And then I actually went to Sierra Leone twice, once in August, and then uh, again in November and January. And I actually, it was amazing. I was there at the very beginning, and then I actually saw the peak in the turn, which made me feel a little better. Um, and so when I was sent, what was my job, really, right? So people, again, ask me, what did I do? And if you think about it, Ebola, there was a lot of science that we already knew. We knew what the infectious agent was. We knew how the disease was spread. We knew pretty well how to prevent it. And then treatment, well, honestly, we didn't know that great about treatment. But I wasn't there to treat people. I was, to, I was sent there to prevent it. So I get into the field. What is it that I am really meant to do? Well, first, let's remember how Ebola is spread and how Ebola is stopped. So here are my people. Other people, other people in other talks have said they think these are ants, but no, these are humans. That's my artistic rendition. Yeah. And okay, so the person that read, read obviously has Ebola. So if we have somebody with Ebola, the first thing we want to do is get them out of the community so they can't spread it to other people. And then we identify all those people 
who were in close contact with that person and wash them to make sure they don't get any symptoms of Ebola. Because if they do, we want to get them out of the community super fast so they can't spread it to anybody else, but we watch anybody near them too. So the whole idea is to isolate people away from the community as fast as possible. So, okay, sounds easy, right? No problem. So what, what exactly do we need? Well, let's think about this on a more logistic level. Okay, first, we need this tent over here, and I, I have the initials there of the MSF, Medicine Sans Frontiers, that's one of the answers to the quest. Um, so that's the group that is like famous for their medical facilities and disease struck areas. So you need somebody to create these tents, these medical centers. You also need somebody to staff them. You need a nurse or a doctor or even just people who are cleaners. You need a way to get the person to there. So we need an ambulance. We need some medicine. And we need knowledge, right? Like if somebody gets Ebola in the community, we need somebody to stand there and say, this is Ebola. Get this person away, protect the population. So you need all of those things to bring it together. The problem is we're in three of the poorest countries in the world. And so those things we need are easy to say and really difficult to find. So, okay, just to remember, make you realize how poor this country is, or these countries are. So U.S. here, I have graphed our gross national income per capita, the other is U.S. I think all of us have an idea what Mexico is like, so there is a comparison with Mexico. There's Sierra Leone, Liberia, and Guinea. Really low. So imagine trying to deal with this in this kind of poverty, how to create this restructure in this kind of poverty. Again, doctors, okay. Um, U.S. and then Mexico, you see we have, we have quite a few doctors for every thousand people. What? It looks like almost two and a half doctors for every thousand person. Sierra Leone, Liberia, and Guinea, so, so few. So how are we supposed to do this? How are we supposed to create a response when you have ghettos and slums that are so crowded it's impossible to find people and get resources? That is why Ebola in West Africa was so difficult. So what did I do? Well, the first thing I did was educate. So we need people out there saying, this is Ebola. We need the public health workers. We need the doctors to recognize Ebola. So I went and educated the health workers. But also, you need people in the populace to recognize Ebola, right? Because if there's so few doctors, you need other people to recognize. So I worked with a lot of different organizations to make public campaign messages. I also worked with radio announcers. We did an education program with radio um, announcers about what to talk about on the radio about Ebola. But then, if you think about it, okay, so many people can read, so many people have a radio, but this population, there's a lot of people who don't read and don't have a radio. How do you reach them? So I worked with some local artists and we actually made picture fit flip books. Um, and these were flip books that told a story about Ebola and how a family got Ebola and how they either died or they protected themselves. And then we actually used local teachers to go house to house and tell the stories using these flip books. And it was impressive how big a crowd we could get just by having flip books of pictures and getting people to understand this disease. And then I guess the last thing I did was organizing. So. Here's a picture of me in one meeting, and at this meeting, you can see there are people from every different aspect of this response. You have to have people who are nurses, you have to have people who are running the laboratory, you have to have people who are burying bodies. All this has to be coordinated. And this country, these countries just weren't prepared for this. They didn't have a structure. So a lot of it fell on me and then the other people like me in the field to help coordinate all this together. So what did I do? I think the easiest thing is anything and everything that came up while I was there. It was you just fill the role that is needed. Okay, so that's story number two. Number three, an insight. So again, this is a call um, from Micronesia, Micronesia, island nation, middle of the Pacific. Imagine the perfect island you ever wanna see. Yes, that's where I had to go, it was horrible. Um, <laughs> But they called because they had three fatal cases of meliodosis. 
and they'd never seen this disease before in their country before, and they were quite shocked. And in fact, the public and the political system were really worried by this. And so they requested our, our help to figure out why the heck did three people suddenly die of this disease? So what is meliodosis? Well, it, essentially in humans it looks like pneumonia, really bad pneumonia. And it's caused by a bacteria that's usually in the soil and in the water. Another quiz question. Um, and so people get infected through it if they are like cut themselves and get soil into their leg or they inhale it when there's a lot of dust. Um, and it's known to be really in a tropical band around the world. It's normal in those places and it's been there through eternity. Most people never show symptoms. So even if we think this is a normal thing to happen in that country, it's weird that three people die. So why are we getting, why were people in Micronesia getting sick with this? So I went over with the idea of trying to figure out a location maybe that people were being exposed to the bacteria, or maybe a specific activity, and try to identify why this was happening. So first, who's exposed? So we got to go and do car to car blood draws. Like that is true service. Um, and they went to houses, and it was similar to what we were doing in the other response I talked about. We take the blood and then see, are there antibodies there saying somebody's been exposed but didn't get sick? But we didn't want to just find out who's sick in the population, who's been exposed in the population. We know this is a bacteria that's usually in soil and in water, so could we find it in soil and water? So we'd ask people, well, we asked the families of the people who got sick, where did they possibly get exposed to soil? Had they been digging anywhere? Were they, you know, working a lot in a garden? Do they swim or do they wash their clothes somewhere? They might get exposed to water. And so based on all that information, we went and we collected soil. We got to dig up a volleyball court. And we went to, into somebody's yard and collected soil from a yard. We, we did something like 20 different soil samples. And we also went and collected water in different water cistern systems. They, this, this island doesn't actually treat its water, so um, you, the water that's actually coming out of the tap could easily have had the bacteria in it. And then we did community outreach, because I think that's a lot of what my job always is. It's trying to get people to understand what the problem is, so there isn't panic and unnecessary fear. People know what to do, so we made posters that were put up in uh, the, the grocery stores about what is meliodosis and how to protect yourself. And then possibly the most important is we talk to healthcare providers because this is a disease that is treatable. And it's quite possible the three people who died died because they didn't give them the right antibiotics. So by educating the healthcare providers, if they get another one to come in, they'd know what to treat the person with and we could save a life. So that was a huge thing we could do. So what was the answer of all this? Well, 20% of the people had been exposed to this bacteria. So it's out there, pretty common. But none of the water or soil samples we took had any bacteria in it. Probably not that surprising when you talk about bacteria because they come and go and it dries out and they die and they come back when it rains. But yeah, so that wasn't great. But we did probably figure out what the issue was. It was actually that the laboratory had recently got trained on how to recognize this bacteria. So it, in, in the laboratories it said it themselves, they think, yeah, we probably had seen this multiple years, but we never, we just thought it was another contaminant. We didn't think anything about it. And now suddenly they knew what it was and they were able to diagnose it. And so suddenly we had an outbreak when there really wasn't an outbreak, it was just a new knowledge. Okay, story four. <coughs> An investigation. So you are probably now to the point of like, why is she in Alaska? <laughs> and I get that question a lot of why are you here? Like you've done all these other things, what's wrong in Alaska? And so I, I'm here as part of the Arctic Investigation Program. Um, so this is a specific field station, it's a branch of CDC. And we are tasked with preventing infectious disease morbidity and mortality in the Arctic and subarctic populations. And we have a special emphasis of working with people who are indigenous. And so this is actually a very unusual branch. Almost no other state has anything like this. This is very unique. And so you wonder why, why is this here? Well, it's here because historically, 
Alaska Native peoples had really uh, high burden of disease compared to the rest of the U.S. population. So this is a graph of kids getting hospitalized for respiratory tract infections, so like pneumonia. And as you can see, back here is 1996. Top line is Alaska Native children versus the middle line there is all American children. You can see there's much more disease at that time in Alaska Native children. Now I'd like to also point out those have come closer together, and part of that is because of CDC's branch. We The branch started, I think, 1970s, something like that. My boss is sitting over there, and he's going to correct me later. Um, but the idea is that we want to take apart this difference between the population. This should not be so different. So people often ask, why is there such a high burden in this population? Well, a lot of it has to do with people live in very isolated villages. So there's no roads, there's no running water. Running water is important to wash away disease. There's no system to remove sewage. So if you have something that's GI passed, it's much easier to get to another person. Um, many people live in a teeny little house, which just means you're in closer contact with each other, which means you just spread disease a lot easier. And then people traditionally and still do cook with and cook and heat with fire, which means they're inhaling a lot of smoke, and your lungs just don't like that. Um, it makes you a lot more susceptible to disease. And then, of course, if you're living far away, it's harder to get access to healthcare. So, all these things together, many, many things, are what makes that difference in disease effects. So. I'm here, and I, so I want to tell you at least one project I'm doing here. I've told you stuff about around the world, but you should know what's happening in Alaska. So I'm working on a project looking at respiratory syncytial virus. And probably if anybody in this room's heard it, of this disease, they've heard of it called RSV. We don't use the full name usually as doctors. And so you also probably hear of your RSV in terms of little kids. So this is a disease we classically think of happening in little, little kids. And if we look at... Um, kids getting hospitalized for respiratory infections, over 60% of the infections are RSV that cause them to get hospitalized. These are little kids who get hospitalized because of one virus. So this, this is something we know is bad. And we know that it's really something that causes a lot of hospitalizations in the United States. So in the US overall, we get over 120,000 hospitalized babies each year because of this. So. What's the difference between here and the rest of the US? Well, okay, US estimates is that about 3% of babies get hospitalized because of this disease. If we look at Alaska Native people who live in urban areas, so really here in Anchorage, it's the same. But if we look at Alaska Native people who live in a rural area, it's five times as much. So for some reason those kids are getting this really badly, and we wanna change that. So okay, I just gave you all the info about kids. Turns out, what happens with adults? And the truth is, we don't know, and it's mostly because we've never looked. Um, we, it might be people are asymptomatic, but it might be also all those illnesses we never like characterize might actually be this virus, and we don't realize it. So part of the reason we're interested in this is because there's about to be an RSV vaccine released probably in the next few years, and so it's interesting to think about. If we find that a large part of people who are adults have RSV, Will it be useful to vaccinate them? And even if we don't want to talk about vaccinating everybody, we could talk about maybe vaccinating pregnant women because they make antibodies and give it to the baby, and the baby then would be protected. Or we could talk about maybe there's people who get worse RSV than the rest of the population. Maybe it's people who have chronic lung disease. Maybe they're the ones who really would benefit from a vaccine. So what I'm here to do, one of my projects, is to look at RSV in adults. So I want to understand who's getting infected, how it's being transmitted, and whether or not you can get it multiple times. And so we're gonna, I'm, I'm, I'm working on a project where we're looking at RSV infection in the YK Delta. And the reason we're choosing the YK Delta is because we know in the YK Delta that's where the kids have it the worst. So if the kids have it the worst there, then probably that's the worst place for adults too. So good place to start. If you're gonna find a problem, you may as well look at where it's the worst possible, right? So we're looking in the YK Delta. And what we're doing is we're saying any adult who's getting hospitalized for a pneumonia or a respiratory illness, we're gonna test them for RSV and see how many of these people are getting hospitalized with this virus we never even looked for before. 
at the same time, we'll also test, te test them for influenza, because maybe, you know, maybe it is mostly influenza that's causing these people to get sick. But we're gonna get an idea of how big a problem is this in adults, and is there certain people who could benefit from a vaccine? And so, here's my picture just to make you all realize what this means. It means we're taking a sample from their sinuses, and you notice how far that tube goes back in the room's head? Yeah, yeah, you, you'd learn how to do this, and you'd never realized your nose goes all that way back. But it does. And so we get a, pretty much a Q-tip and shove it all the way back there, and then test them to see if they have this virus. Luckily, they, you know, it's really quick. I, they, I, did, I had it done to me, as you know, I feel like if anybody, if you're gonna do something to other people, you have to do it to yourself, or have somebody do it to you. And, she right there did it to me, and I survived. <laughs> so eventually, this project, we hope we're gonna be able to identify high-risk people who would benefit from the vaccine. And then maybe we can identify disease transmission patterns. Is it something where adults are giving it to little kids? And we didn't even realize it. So this is a project where, or a story where there's no end yet, but I'm here to help finish it. So, Summarize, what do I do? I respond to outbreaks, I train healthcare workers, I train the public health leaders, I design and carry out studies. And, and, and then it means that I have quite an eclectic life. I have this side of me that's the science and the medicine and all that knowledge that I put in my head. But on the other hand, there's a lot of this other stuff that I never realized I was gonna be doing. Being a diplomat where you're trying to get people to work together as you saw, my highly artistic skills, I have got to pull those two together. Being people who really push and get things to happen. So it's been a, it's, it's a very interesting career because it brings together all these different things that I didn't realize I was gonna do. And so with that, I will finish, and I don't know how much questions you have, time do we have, or, yeah, take questions. rather astounded to see CDC figures that stated that 18 out of 100 women would get pregnant if their sole means of contraception was prophyla prophylactics. Could you, do you have any figures on what the disease transmission rate would be since it seems that it would be easier to be contagious than get pregnant? Um, I, I certainly don't have knowledge in that area, so I can't tell you anything more than what you just said. So he's asking me about 
Um, he saw figures where CDC says that 18% of uh, women would get pregnant, or 18% of women would get pregnant each year if even using pro prophylaxis. Yeah, with their so uh, many. And he's wondering if it has a re if that can relate it to disease transmission. I, I don't have knowledge on that. I'm sorry. Yes. Um, so your job, you're basically the main character in the average Michael Crichton movie. Yeah, obviously. And so <laughs> I just wonder, especially traveling to all of these different areas, does it ever get in your head a little bit as far as needing to be hyper vigilant, or or how do you protect yourself so that you don't kind of get paranoid about being around these new these diseases? Uh, so she's she's asking uh, how do I how do I deal with being in risky situations? Um, I, I think it is partially a personality thing, right? I am someone who just doesn't worry that much. Um, but also, I think it's also about being educated. Um, so a lot of people panicked about Ebola, but when you really looked at how Ebola was transmitted, it was through body fluids. And so all of us sitting here, even if one of us had flaring Ebola, Maybe the person who they shared the drink with would be have a problem, but all the rest of us would be completely safe. If I came and spit on you and I had Ebola, that <laughs> might be a problem, but honestly, how many people do you swap body fluids with every, okay, don't answer that. Um, <laughs> but it really shouldn't be a risk, and especially when you go out there, you have that knowledge, and that was, I was in the Ebola response, I had that knowledge, and so I didn't get worried unnecessarily. And certainly you take precautions. Um, you, it, our goal is not to send people out to get sick. So you make sure you go out with the, you know, if, if we were to do something that's airborne, which I personally never have, we'd be wearing masks and we'd be making sure we don't get the disease. So it's something I think that helps a lot to have the knowledge um, and then also be somebody who's not super nervous. <laughs> yeah. uh, I have a question about the first um, part of it, the monkeypox. Has any uh, follow-up research been done on whether or not the squirrels are were the vector, or so, so he's asking if we did follow-up research into the monkeypox um, to see if it was reconfirmed or if we have further evidence it was uh, squirrels who were transmitting it. So one thing we did while we were there is we actually did animal trapping. So it wasn't me, but we had a team who were specifically ecologists and had a lot of experience with animals. So they trapped. Um, multiple hundreds of animals of all different species, and then they tested them to see if either they had the virus or if they had the antibody to the virus. None of them had the virus, but they did see in squirrels um, higher than any others that they had antibody to the virus. Um, and just like many things in public health, it's not science where you can just redo the experiment. We have to wait to have a natural experiment. So monkeypox just comes in these waves, and it's hard to, know why it's doing these waves. So if we want to ask questions about monkeypox, we have to wait until another wave hits. And so we can't go out and like try to see, are people eating squirrels now? Yes, they will be, because they always do. But it might be something periodic in squirrels, and then it gets periodically transmitted to humans. So it's difficult to do the perfect analysis, or perfect design of an experiment when we're dealing with humans. Uh, she's asking about how we uh, stored the samples from blood um, for tests. So it depends on exactly what test you're doing. Um, antibodies, you can actually dry. When you saw that person getting their finger pricked in the beginning of the monkeypox outbreak, um, it's sucked up into a little like, uh, piece of paper. And it, we actually intentionally dried it out. And then we put water on it and let it rehydrate when we get it back to the lab. So antibodies, at least for that one, are stable enough that they can go through this drying process and rehydration. Different things are different though. So some tests you do need to put them on ice. And for example, um, the Ebola response, that was a huge thing about getting things refrigerated quickly. And that was a huge part of what the international community provided is we got refrigeration units in and ways to transport things. So 
you asking about the relationship between CDC, state, and federal governments? So CDC is a federal agency, um, and so states have complete jurisdiction of their area. Um, so, for example, he's mentioned Zika in Florida. CDC could not go in and do anything about Zika in Florida until the Florida government asked them to. So we are completely bound by that. Um, what's slightly different here in Alaska is we're working with the Alaska Native population, and so that's independent tribal nations. Um, and there is also this long-standing, very good agreement between the states and CDC in this specific location here in Alaska because it is, in a way, Alaska has two different things going on at once, and so it's good to have people think, approach it from different ways. So this is an example of good politics where people have agreed and worked together. So she's asking about difficulties uh, with vaccines that are for very small populations and how you can get that to move forward in a way, right? And it is very true because people who make vaccines don't usually do it just because they really like making vaccines. They actually do want to make money. Um, so it's hard when it's a very small population. So how do you put all this research dollar into something where you might only have a few thousands of people to vaccinate? Um, there are government programs like uh, orphan drug programs that are specifically aimed to address that for some things. But you bring up the issue of Alaska Native it, it, having this specific population. So I don't think we've ever found a disease that's in the Alaska Native population that's not also a large problem in the rest of the population. So what we find in Alaska Natives is just maybe a, a good window into a problem. And so RSV in the Alaska Native population might be more severe, but it's going to be very similar in the rest of the population. So an RSV vaccine for Alaska Natives is going to still be a similar idea for the rest of the population. I'm specifically thinking of like homophilus influenza type A instead of B, that type of thing, where it doesn't necessarily happen. Yeah. I think you're getting beyond what I can really comment on. <laughs>